Well, good morning. Oh, you got more in you than that. Good morning. A happy 4th of July to you. I am so grateful that you have come, whether in person or online, to help grow or explore your faith uh, with us today. We are in the midst of a series going through the book of First Peter. And before we get into that, I just want to let you know that our church here has a, an incredibly high value, an incredibly high view of Scripture. We believe that uh, it was inspired by God, that he used a bunch of different humans to help give us some incredible instructions for how we can best live here on this earth. It's filled with promises from God. It tells us the arc of how human history is going to go. And there are, uh, so, so yeah, so we view this book really, really highly. But the truth of this book is that it also can be used as a weapon, which is of course not at all what God intended it for it to be used as, but here we are as humanity, we can mess up pretty much anything, <laughs> including our use of the Bible. And there are these certain passages within scripture that I like to call the clobber passages, where people will take their Bibles and they will use it to clobber down people. Again, not what this book was made for, but here we are, humanity, <laughs> doing what we do best. Uh, so you've got these, these clobber passages. You've got uh, passages where uh, people have used Scripture to support slavery and to say that one man is greater than another man, which is, of course, not the intended message of Scripture, but it has been used that way in human history. Or you've got these other passages where uh, manipulative, primarily men, have used it to say that women, you are less than, you are not as great as, you are not equal. And so that message has been pervasive, not just in culture, but the Bible has been used to, to make that message as well. And the passage that we're going to be looking at today talks about wives submitting to husbands. And there's also a section that talks about women as the weaker vessel. So yeah, I get the, <laughs> I get the great easy passage in scripture today on our nice, bright July 4th holiday. <laughs> um, but here's what I think can actually happen for us is that we hear a message like women are the weaker vessel and we hear that and we think, well, that hasn't been my experience. Like my experience, I've seen some incredibly strong women. I'm not just talking about deadlifting. I'm talking about internal strength that resides inside. And what we do when we, when we hear the disconnect between the message of Scripture and our, how we experience life is we either say, well, that book is antiquated and old and doesn't apply to me, or we get angry at God for setting up saying these things or confused at the least. And so today, we are going to do a Bible study, verse by verse, going through 1 Peter chapter 3, and look at the intended message of Scripture here, and look at the holistic message of the Bible as well, trying to help answer the question, how does the Bible actually view women? Which is one of the most divided, divisive questions in, in all of Christendom. And we are going to look at what happens when you and your spouse are not on the same page spiritually. What do you do? So we are going to jump into 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up, or it will be here on the screen. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. 
Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and it heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. So the overarching message of this section of passage is really talking about how do, you, how do people in this culture live when you're living in a society that does not value God's ways? When you're living in a place where it's a pagan society, and maybe for you, you've even felt that way at certain times. Like, how do I follow Jesus when it feels like nobody else around me is doing so? And so Peter here, it's really important to understand his intended target for this message when he's talking about submission. Peter is writing directly to women who are married to unbelieving husbands. So this is not a, a women and a men's issue specifically. This is very specific to the sacred covenant of marriage and how that relationship is supposed to best work. Paul, who writes much of the New Testament, and Peter never say that all women should submit to all men. It's talking about the covenant of marriage. Listen again to what verse 1 says. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of you wives. And here's the thing. I've had several conversations with, with many of you in, in our church, and sometimes it can feel like if you are not on the same page as your spouse spiritually, for some people that's not a huge thing. But for others of you, this is the deepest stressor in all of your life. Like this is the thing that keeps you up at night. Maybe there's a situation where you are, have decided to follow after Jesus with your life and your spouse is not on the same page with you. And that is why this message here is so pertinent and so important if you are in a situation like that. The verse says, the husbands may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. In other words, your actions are more likely to win over those who you love to Christ than your arguments. Your actions are actually what's going to help turn the page and draw somebody closer to Jesus. We don't, we don't just try to argue with people into the kingdom. We love people into the kingdom. And that's not just true for an unbelieving spouse. That's true for all sectors of our lives, for our, for our family, for our children, for our co-workers, for anywhere we're going in our lives. It is an important message. And this text goes on. It's really important to note that it talks about the way that those behavior and those actions come out is through purity and reverence. And, and I think really what this passage is getting at, it's really talking about using your respect, using your God-honoring life to help draw people closer to God. Really what this passage is about is about influencing people towards his grace, that you and I have been given the great commission to go and make disciples, to show God's love in every sector of our world. Your actions are what is going to be the tipping point for others. That is how we influence people. And especially it's pertinent for those in our family who do not yet know how much God really loves them. So looking at verses three and four, it talks about this. It says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles, that's why I comb my hair nice and over to the side today. And the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. That wasn't in my notes or the Bible. Uh, rather, it should be that of your inner self. And here's the thing. Makeup or, or fancy clothes or, or jewelry, any of these things, they are not evil in and of themselves at all. They, they are not. That's not what this passage is getting it. But sometimes what it can be is a form of what my wife likes to call feminine armor. It's, it's like putting up a, a front. And, and uh, so, so it's not a, a wrong thing to do in and of, the, of itself. But here's the heart of what God is really getting at is 
not to use all of our time, energy, and resources focusing on our outward appearance, but instead to be focused on our souls. Like our bodies all have an expiration date to them, but our souls are eternal. And ultimately what God is after is after a relationship with you and who you are. And so that's what God is, is calling us to. And before we as dudes start to think, oh, this is just a message that's uh, just relevant for the ladies, you, gotta, you always have to be looking at the holistic message of Scripture. Anytime you're taking out just one little section and uh, just pulling it out to say what you want it to say, you're in dangerous, dangerous territory. But if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 7, there's a message sent directly to a man. And it says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, in this world that's filled with Instagram likes and how good we look can, can help increase our followers and our influence in this world, vanity wasn't just a problem back then, it's a problem now. And it's not a gender-specific problem. It can be there for any of us. And the truth of it is, is that uh, fashion or, or nice things, nice clothes or accessories, they, they have value because of what they carry for their outward appearance or their function. But you carry value because you are an image bearer of God. It is so much infinitely more. And that's, it, it's actually super freeing when we start to realize that our value is not found in how we look. It's found in who we are and whose we are. If you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. So we are going to continue to look onward at verse number four. And in order for us to do this, I am going to invite my lovely wife, Sarah, up to help share a story. So would you give a warm Calvary Assembly welcome to Mrs. Sarah Sigmund. Are there, are there fireworks going off in here or is it just you? <laughs> I said no to the dad joke. Okay. Where's mine? Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah, and I am going to talk specifically about verse 4 in this passage and my path to understanding it. So in verse 4, Peter says, So he had just finished saying your beauty shouldn't come from the outward stuff. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So I read that for the first time at 15, and interpreted it as the thing, the actions, the personality, the kind of person that is considered beautiful to God is someone who's gentle and quiet. This was profoundly bad news for me because I'm really loud and very opinionated and extremely outgoing. So that was unfortunate. So, but I really did in my heart, I, I wanted to please God and I was very sincere. And so I set about fixing my personality. And I noticed that other people were already born with this personality, these like sweet, gentle people who were soft-spoken and seemed to like sitting still and arts and crafts. And it seemed a little inequitable that they were born with that. And I had to overcome how I was born in order to please God, but onward. So at about 16, well, most of my friends at the time were watching MTV and VH1, were these two TV channels that were popular when I was a teenager. And people would watch, it was called um, The Real World. It's like a soap opera. It's a really bad idea. Probably ruined a lot of lives, made a lot of money. But that's what my friends were into. And they would watch MTV. And I, at 16 years old, found a Christian book magazine, located a Bible study, called Putting on a Gentle and Quiet Spirit. It was lilac purple with really poor flower clip art on the cover. And I thought, oh good, this will fix me. Bought it, did it, cover to cover, great Bible study, closed to the last page, still me. Unfortunate. So I continued, I really tried. And in college, I used to even, I used to even take a pen and write little notes on my hand to remind myself to kind of tone it down, 
to pull it back, that I was supposed to be sweet and quiet, and that was the goal. And then as a young adult, I read a book that was largely forgettable, but on two pages, the author addressed this verse specifically and how it had been misunderstood for women. And she said that it's talking about a gentle and quiet spirit. And when you're with somebody who has a gentle and quiet spirit, you have permission to be who you are in their presence. And you have the space to be whoever God is making you to be. The opposite of a gentle and quiet spirit was not loud. The opposite of gentle isn't opinionated. The opposite of gentle is judgmental and pushy. And the opposite of quiet in this context wasn't that I'm loud. The opposite of quiet, a quiet spirit is a striving spirit and a comparing spirit and a put you down spirit. And so you can have a gentle and quiet spirit with any personality because that's the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. That means that when people are with you, they can feel peace and they can feel joy. And so I found that to be a really freeing experience and understanding of that verse that I was able to embody the gentle and quiet spirit that was my experience with the Holy Spirit while still being me, because that is apparently unchangeable. <laughs> can we give it up for Sarah? Thank you. A gentle and quiet spirit is not a call to modify your personality. Thank you. So this passage continues on to actually talk about holiness in verses five and six. So let's dive into that again. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Now, submitting and obeying can, for some of us, can like send a shiver up our spine because what we think about is somebody trying to control somebody else. And that is not what this passage is about. And even in other passages of scripture that talk about submission, that is not the intended purpose. Uh, so for instance, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, he says, he, he writes about wives submitting to husbands, but it's within this context where a husband is loving his wife so much so that he would love her so much that he would lay down his life like Christ did for the church. It's not hard to submit to somebody who's willing to die for you. And, and that's the thing, we, we get these messages twisted up. It's, it's, and it's when we do get the interpretation wrong that we get really frustrated either with other people or we get angry at God. Submission is not about control. Subjugation is about control. Submission is about mutual love and about order. It's about respect. And that's when it's actually a beautiful gift loving each other within the context of marriage, mutual love, submission for one another. And our calling is to submit in love, to love our spouse like Christ did the church. And here's what I believe. God is calling us, each and every one of us, to commitment and to faith, especially those of us who have made that commitment to our spouses, that we would be helping to create strong, enduring Christian uh, marriages in a world that says, hey, you just go pursue whatever it is that you want. Just go find joy, even if it means leaving all this responsibility behind. Like you just find yourself, girl. It's totally cool. No, like that is not what God has called us to. And that's not actually where true joy is found. It's not about control. It's about mutual love for one another. We as a church are being called to be courageous and faithful to one another and to God. If you believe it, that's a good place to say amen. And this passage, it's important to note, is not just written for women. It also addresses the husbands as well. And it says this, husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner 
and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Verse 7 here is not sending a message that women are just less than or they are universally weak. Again, we need to use the whole context of Scripture to understand God's view of women. But before, that, before we do that, I want us also to recognize the culture with which this would, was written in, because that helps us understand uh, what it is like and what it was like 2,000 years ago. And so I'm going to invite the worship team back out while we break down some ancient culture's views from philosophers. So Plato said this, he argued that men were superior to women and children and that the entire basis of society depended on these hierarchies. In the late second century, Tertullian wrote that women are the devil's gateway. Uh, he'd be canceled today. <laughs> Augustine went so far as to say this, Women, women on their own do not bear the image of God. Like that's the, that's the message, that's, the, that's what part is part of the pervasive culture at that time. And then the New Testament has an incredibly countercultural message to send to women. It's radical for its time and for its culture. Paul writes extensively and praises the women who helped start and, and uh, grow the early church. He was really grateful for that in a time where women were viewed as very little more than property and as vessels to have children. Like that was it. But Jesus and the totality of the Bible has a radically pro-women message. It fills the pages with them. And it happened long before our American 1960s women's rights movement. It happened 2,000 years earlier than that. God has always been pro-humanity, <laughs> men and women. Disciples and influencers of the church have always come in both genders. There's this powerful, powerful verse that we could spend a whole hour just unpacking in and of itself. In Galatians 3.28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, ethnicity, neither slave nor free, socio or socioeconomic status, nor is there male and female, gender, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. God has always used women to help accomplish the purposes of the kingdom of God. Listen to this. Esther was a courageous queen that worked with her uncle Mordecai to help save her people, the Jews, in Persia. Deborah was a leader, a prophetess, a judge, and a compassionate one at that in a time where there was hardly any compassionate judges around. She helped to serve an oppressed population and helped direct the commander of Israel's army, Barak, to a military victory. You've got Mary who says yes to bearing the, the savior of the world. You've got Priscilla, who's an amazing woman of God. She started a, a, an incredible ministry for the poor, and she helped to instruct Apollos, who was a powerful teacher in the New Testament church. You've got Rahab, whose body was literally purchased for pleasure, and who the culture would say is not worth anything, who God actually uses in incredible ways to house spies. And it's from her lineage that comes the line of David. It's from the lineage of David that comes the savior of the world in Jesus Christ. You've got the testimony of Mary and Mary, the first people who God chooses to reveal the most important moment in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a, in a culture that did not value the testimony of women. God chooses women to reveal himself too in Mary and Mary. Women were filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost when the church exploded with growth. Phoebe was a deacon. Priscilla was an elder. Junia was an apostle. And why is all of this important? Because this message has been twisted for far too long. God has always empowered women to do what they have been called to do. 
And he has, he has called every single one of us, men and women, to step into our God-given purposes. It's not about trying to suppress women and their voices. It's about all of us stepping into our influence that God has given to every one of us. And what's this passage talking about? Influencing those who don't yet know, who are unbelievers, who don't know yet just how good God's grace is for their life. Every single one of us has a chance to be an influence for Him. You and me, given the greatest mission the world has ever been given in the Great Commission to go and to make disciples, changing our world by the love of Christ, not by our arguments, but instead by walking in love, by showing His love. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for giving us the church, how you have invited us to be your hands and your feet, regardless of how we look, regardless of our socioeconomic status, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of our gender, Lord, you have called us. Lord, your word says in Acts 2, 17, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men will dream dreams. Lord, help us to prophesy of your goodness, of your coming, that it is not finished yet, but you are coming back. Allow us to walk in your plans and your purposes. We trust you, Jesus. And all who agree with that prayer said, amen. Amen. Let's worship.